In late July of 1944, Adolf Hitler was furious. There had just been an assassination plot in his life while he was in his field headquarters, the Wolf's Lair, in what was codenamed Operation Valkyrie. A bomb in a briefcase was detonated in a conference room. Hitler was meeting there with 20 of his most senior officers. However, Hitler survived with only relatively minor injuries. And he came out looking for blood. In the aftermath, the Gestapo arrested more than 7,000 people and executed 4,980 of them. Among them was the prominent German theologian, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. How did he get caught up in this? Well, today, Bonhoeffer is considered a modern martyr. He chose to suffer with his people and to actively oppose evil. He did it because of his Christian faith and he paid for it with his life. Real persecution and martyrdom aren't something that most people in the West are familiar with. Bonhoeffer's fascinating story gives us insights into how the issues around persecution aren't necessarily simple. Join me as we follow his story and find out what it takes to make a martyr. I'm here beside the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus gave us the Beatitudes. The center of Jesus' teachings about the Kingdom of God is the Sermon on the Mount. And at the very heart of the Sermon on the Mount are the Beatitudes. So if we want to really know what it means to be a follower of Jesus and to live as a citizen of the Kingdom of God, then we must understand Christ's teaching in the Beatitudes. But the Beatitudes aren't just spiritual principles for Christians. They are arguably the body of principles that has been most influential in shaping Western civilization as we know it today. The word Beatitude is an old fashioned religious sounding word that not many people will recognize today. It refers to being blissfully happy. When Jesus calls people blessed in the Beatitudes, that's exactly what He means. He means that if you display these qualities, you will be blissfully happy. This is a happiness that belongs only to God and that can come only from God. In other words, when in your life you display the qualities Jesus describes in the Beatitudes, you will share in the joy of heaven here on earth. It's the only way to truly live. Jesus sat on a hill so that the large crowd could hear Him. And He taught the people the most radical and influential set of principles for living that this world has ever heard. And among the Beatitudes, He said this in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Like each of the Beatitudes, there is a great truth hidden in this radical contradiction. And this great truth can be seen played out in the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. In our modern world, when we hear the word martyr, we most often associate it with radical religious fundamentalists who believe it's their duty to die in the process of murdering as many people as possible who oppose their personal beliefs. But that's not what the Christian Bible teaches that martyrdom is. To be a martyr means to stand up and witness for the love and truth of God, even at the cost of your own life. There have been countless millions of martyrs for God throughout history. We know the names of a few, but the names of most have today been forgotten by us, but not by God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a modern day martyr. 
And we want to share the story of Dietrich Bonhoeffer to illustrate the meaning of this beatitude. His life illustrates that it's not easy to tread the path of persecution. Now, you may think that what I've just said is obvious, but it isn't. Because being persecuted because of righteousness is not simply a matter of what others do to you. It's the intensely personal inner conflict and soul searching that goes along with it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer's path in life was set when, at the age of 12, he shocked his family by announcing that he wanted to become a theologian, a Bible scholar and expert in Christianity and religion. From an early age, Dietrich had shown great musical talent on the piano and his aristocratic family was convinced that he was headed for a glittering musical career. That's why his family was so taken aback when he told them of his decision to study theology and the Bible. Dietrich was as good as his word. And when he was 21 years old, he earned his first doctorate, graduating summa cum laude. In Germany, it's a requirement for academics to complete two doctorates before being qualified to hold academic positions. That's why three years later, he went on to complete a second doctorate in theology. In between doctorates, Dietrich spent time in Spain, working as a youth pastor to German expatriates. After completing his second doctorate, Dietrich was still too young to be ordained as a pastor. So in 1930, at the age of 24, he went to the United States to do further postgraduate study and to teach at the Union Theological Seminary in New York. At that time, Union Theological Seminary was a hotbed of liberalism and modern thought, and Bonhoeffer was not impressed. There's no theology here, he wrote. However, through his friendship with African-American pastors, Bonhoeffer began to see the Gospels from below, as he called it, from the perspective of those who suffer oppression. His experiences abroad helped turn the Gospels from mere words to reality. After his time in New York, Dietrich returned to Germany in 1931, where he was ordained as a pastor and took up the position of lecturer at the University of Berlin at just 25 years of age. At around this time, it became clear that Dietrich had undergone somewhat of a personal conversion. He had gone from being mainly attracted to the intellectual side of Christianity to becoming a man of faith who was dedicated to carrying out the teachings of Christ as he found them revealed in the Gospels. This was a time of great upheaval in Germany. A new leader, the charismatic Adolf Hitler was emerging, and he seemed to be the nation's answer to prayer. Hitler's rise to power was welcomed enthusiastically by most parts of German society, including most of the Lutheran Church, the dominant church of the nation. One pastor wrote at this time, Christ has come to us through Adolf Hitler. However, Bonhoeffer opposed Adolf Hitler from the very beginning. Just two days after Hitler's election as Chancellor in January 1933, Bonhoeffer made a radio broadcast criticising him, warning of the idolatrous cult of the Fuhrer and Nazism that was sweeping Germany. His broadcast was cut off mid-air. Bonhoeffer was also the first religious voice to call for Christian resistance to Hitler's persecution of the Jews. In his opposition to Hitler's policies, Bonhoeffer also courageously went against his own church. Bonhoeffer felt disillusioned by the weakness of the church in opposing the evils of Nazism. And in the autumn of 1933, he accepted a two-year appointment to pastor a German-speaking Protestant church in London. While in London, Bonhoeffer was offered a well-sought-after opportunity to study nonviolent resistance under Gandhi in India. 
However, Bonhoeffer turned down the opportunity, but he'd already made up his mind to return to his Germany. That was because he felt called to return and share in his homeland struggles despite the bleak situation there. So after two years in London, Bonhoeffer returned to Germany. On his return to Germany, Bonhoeffer found himself denounced as a pacifist and as an enemy of the state. In 1936, he was forbidden to teach and his books were officially banned. For two years, Bonhoeffer conducted underground seminaries, traveled throughout the country, secretly teaching pastors. He would change location constantly to stay one step ahead of the dreaded Gestapo. During these two years, while he taught and ran from the Gestapo, Bonhoeffer wrote a study on the Sermon on the Mount, which is called in English, The Cost of Discipleship. In it, Bonhoeffer argued true discipleship really costs. In fact, it costs everything. Bonhoeffer attacked cheap grace as a cover for ethical laxity. Instead, Bonhoeffer preached costly grace. This is what he wrote. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ, living and incarnate. By now, Bonhoeffer was becoming more and more worried that he would soon be arrested. So in June 1939, he left Germany for the safety of the United States. The plan was for Bonhoeffer to safely sit out the war abroad. But as soon as Bonhoeffer stepped off the ship in New York City, he knew that he didn't belong there. His place was back in Germany. He didn't feel relieved to be safe. All he felt was guilt for not having the courage to practice what he preached. Bonhoeffer's personal mantra was, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. Within a month, Bonhoeffer was back in Germany in the full knowledge that he was stepping right back into persecution. Then surprisingly, Bonhoeffer did something that no one expected he would do. Incredibly, he managed to join the German secret service. But here's why. He joined as a double agent. Bonhoeffer worked secretly behind the scenes to save as many Jews from the death camps as possible. As part of his work as a double agent, Bonhoeffer also made contact with some military officers who were secretly part of the small German resistance opposed to Adolf Hitler. Through them, Bonhoeffer also had information about various assassination plots to kill Hitler. However, it was during a rescue attempt trying to help some German Jews escape to Switzerland that led to Bonhoeffer's arrest. One April afternoon in 1943, two men arrived in a black Mercedes, put Bonhoeffer in the car and took him to Tegel Prison. Bonhoeffer spent two years in prison. He spent his time writing letters to his friends and family, as well as being a pastor to his fellow prisoners. His letters and writings were smuggled out by sympathetic guards. Here is something he wrote during his years in prison. It shows us what encouraged him during his dark years of suffering. As we read them, notice the echoes of the writings of the Apostle Paul. God lets himself be pushed out of the world onto the cross. He is weak and powerless in the world. And that is precisely the way, the only way, in which he is with us and helps us. The Bible makes quite clear that Christ helps us not by virtue of his omnipotence, but by virtue of his weakness and suffering. 
The Bible directs man to God's powerlessness and suffering. Only the suffering God can help. On the 20th of July, 1944, there was a failed bomb plot to assassinate Hitler. It was the closest that any attempt had come to killing him, and the Führer was furious. Bonhoeffer and many others who had resisted Hitler's regime in any way whatsoever were sentenced to death. So Bonhoeffer was sent to the extermination camp at Flossenburg. Pain best, a captured RAF pilot and fellow prisoner, wrote this observation of Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer was different, just quite calm and normal, seemingly perfectly at his ease. His soul really shone in the dark desperation of our prison. He was one of the very few men I've ever met to whom God was real and ever close to him. At the break of dawn on April 9, 1945, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was hanged. As they prepared him for his death, he preached a final sermon. His words were remembered and later retold by Payne Best. He said, This is for me the end, the beginning of life. Today, Bonhoeffer is remembered as a great modern martyr for the message of Jesus Christ. His principled resistance to Hitler's regime became a source of inspiration for other great modern leaders, such as Martin Luther King. So what did Jesus mean 2,000 years ago when he said right here, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness? When Jesus said this, the word for witness and the word for martyr were the same words. In other words, when you witness to the truth of what you knew about Jesus, you could expect to be persecuted. It also works the other way around. Being persecuted and giving up your life for the truth about Jesus was the ultimate form of witnessing for Him. We know that all of Christ's disciples were persecuted and all except one died a martyr's death. But it's easy to think that this beatitude was relevant to the first centuries of Christianity, but not so much now. Well, there are two realities that should make us rethink this. The first one is that according to the nonprofit organization Open Doors, last year alone, there were over 250 million Christians living in places where they experienced high levels of persecution. And 4,305 Christians were killed for their faith, basically for saying that they believed in Jesus Christ. And the second reality is that the Bible tells us this in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. In other words, and unfortunately, persecution is business as usual in this world of ours. If you're a follower of Jesus and you aren't being persecuted, then thank God that you are living in a tiny bubble of time and space in which you are being spared. The other thought that comes from this verse is that those who live godly lives won't look for persecution. It will come to them. If you are a follower of Jesus, then you should really understand that most Christians in the world don't have the luxury you have. And you can be sure that things will go back someday to business as usual. There were a number of reasons why Christians were persecuted in the first centuries of Christianity. In the end, they all came down to the fact that they were different. Christians had different values to the rest of their culture. At the core, Christians refused to worship what the rest of their world worshipped. In the first centuries of Christianity, persecution could take a variety of forms, ranging from being socially ostracised to being killed in the most barbaric and prolonged ways possible. Today, persecution in some parts of the world continues in these ways, and in other more developed nations, 
it also continues in more sophisticated and subtle forms. The only weapons which followers of Jesus can use against persecution are the intelligent presentation of Bible beliefs and importantly, the loving demonstration of the Christian life. But how is it possible for Christ to say that those who are persecuted are supremely happy? Well, William Barclay puts it this way, persecution is in fact a compliment. To persecute a person is to show that we take him so seriously that we consider that he must be eliminated. Persecution only comes to the man whose life is so positive and real in its effectiveness that society regards him as a danger. To be persecuted is to be complimented as a real Christian. Persecution is also an opportunity. It's an opportunity to demonstrate loyalty, to show that a person is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ and that he isn't afraid to show whose he is and whom he serves. To be persecuted is to walk in the way of the greatest followers of God. But most importantly of all, to be persecuted is to walk in the way of Jesus Christ. In this beatitude, Jesus said this, In the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Over and over again, the verdict of history has been in favour of the persecuted and not the persecutors. So too, God will pronounce His verdict in favour of His persecuted followers. That's why the Bible says this in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12. If we suffer with Him, we shall also reign with Him. In fact, here is perhaps the deepest thought of all about those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. The Bible says that when we go through this experience, we are suffering together with Christ. But what could that possibly mean? Well, it's this. Those who accept and endure persecution for the sake of Jesus Christ are placed in a special relationship with Him. They have followed the example of Christ and walked in His steps for the sake of righteousness and love. We who aren't being persecuted right now might not understand, but Paul, a man who was hounded by persecution for the sake of Jesus, certainly understood what Jesus meant when He said, blessed are those who are persecuted. He understood how it was that it was these people who were the ones who were supremely happy. That's why Paul wrote this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. If a Christian's greatest desire really is to be united with Jesus, then that relationship means that he or she will be prepared to go through both the good times and times of suffering, even persecution. In short, we must be prepared to suffer together with Christ and also to be raised up with Him. Remember Jesus said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. That means because of the righteousness of Jesus, it means for His sake, not ours. It says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then, there are those followers of Jesus who know that persecution will come and they fear it. If that's you, then Jesus is calling you to a deeper relationship with Him, to experience a more perfect love. Because as the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18, perfect love casts out fear. When you love Jesus so much, that your greatest desire is to be like Him, loving, patient and kind, you'll be ready for whatever may come, even persecution. To enter into that kind of love of the truth, you need to love God's Word and hold fast to it. It will draw you to Jesus. It will draw you to the cross. 
If you would like Jesus as the focal point of your life because of what Jesus did for you at the cross, then nothing will be too great a sacrifice for Him. If you want to accept Jesus like that and follow Him, then I'd like to recommend the free gift we have for all our incredible journey viewers today. It's the easy to read booklet, Never Give Up. This small booklet will only take you a few minutes to read, but it could assist you to remain faithful to Jesus and help you find the right words to be a real blessing and encouragement to others. This booklet is our gift to you and is absolutely free. I guarantee that there are no costs or obligations whatsoever. So make sure you take this wonderful opportunity to receive the free gift we have for you today. Phone or text us at 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand or visit our website tij.tv to request today's free offer and we'll send it to you totally free of charge and with no obligation. Write to us at GPO Box 274, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001, Australia or PO Box 76673, Manukau, Auckland, 2241, New Zealand. Don't delay. Call or text us now. If you have enjoyed our journey to Galilee and Israel and our reflections on the Beatitudes and those who are persecuted for their belief in Jesus and trust in God, then be sure to join us again next week when we will share another of life's journeys together. Until then, may you find and experience the inner peace and happiness that comes to those who know Jesus and trust in Him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we think back in awe to all the martyrs who gave their lives for You. And then we thank You for the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for our sins. Father, we pray for grace and mercy for those who are being persecuted for Your sake today. Give us the courage to be strong in the circumstances in which we are living today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.